You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. Everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way, you have everything you need always and in everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As it is written, he's scattered everywhere. He gave to the needy. His righteousness remains forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, welcome back for what is week two, or sorry, the second to last week, so two to the last, of our sermon series that we've been in here at the end of this summer entitled Committed, Committed, how we are spending this sort of uh, post-summer, pre-fall time is really using this as an opportunity for you, for me, for all of us to really re-engage, to realign, to recommit ourselves to what we might understand to be the five essentials of a well-balanced faith. Now, what are those five? Well, for us here in our tradition, it looks like this. We believe that uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a Christian, is that we are those who are consistently seeking to love God by way of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. We've talked about three of the five already, and so today we're continuing that conversation, and today specifically we're moving into the conversation on gifts. What does it mean to love God, not only with my prayers and my spirituality, but my generosity? How might I love and serve God by way of my generosity to the church, to my neighbor, to anyone and everyone in need? Now, Whenever we go into topics like this, I always feel like I need to offer a disclaimer. Because if you've spent any time in church before, you know that sometimes whenever a pastor like me gets up to talk about the topic of giving or generosity, well, we've got a complicated history on this topic, don't we? Right? Many of you have been a part of church services, you've been a part of sermons that have left you feeling manipulated. Some of them have left you uh, sort of feeling guilt-ridden. And let's just be real. Others of you have felt like uh, you heard sermons that just kicked you while you were down. Oftentimes, the church has done a really poor job of coming alongside those who uh, are suffering financially, maybe because they experienced unexpected uh, medical bills or they lost their job. And so they leave that worship service feeling like not only uh, guilty, but they feel like they're failing, failing God, failing their Christian walk because they're not doing more. And if that's you, by the way, if that's you, if this uh, arena of your life uh, has been one where you have suffered more than you have thrived as of late, uh, I want to say the same thing to you that Jesus says to us, which is this. One of the things I love so much about Jesus is that the way in which he treats us, the way in which he engages with us is on an individual level. He says this in the Gospel of Luke, to whom much is given, much will be required. Now, why I love that so much is because that also means that if that's true, then that means the opposite is also true. That to whom little is given, or for whom, you've got very little to give, financially, sure, but spiritually, emotionally, relationally. God's not the one standing by judging you for that, shaming you for that, mad at you for that. God understands that. Furthermore, God's response to those of us who are suffering is to help, right? To bring freedom, right? 
And so we do too, we do too. And so very, very quickly, for if this is the case for anyone in this room, or if you know someone, if you know someone for whom they are, it seems like they're just living underneath the, like the bonds of financial struggle, I want to encourage you uh, that part of where you can find help is by going here. So if you go to our website, this is actually our homepage, this is what it looks like. And if you scroll down on our homepage, uh, you'll find a button right there in the middle that says Request Care. If you click on that button and you scroll down again, uh, there are all forms of uh, different care uh, that we want to provide and type of support we want to offer to you in this church. But you can see one of them uh, is listed financial support. And we actually have members of this church who are either retired or who are currently financial advisors, and they have agreed to do so free of charge, without cost, to come alongside families who find themselves just struggling to get out from underneath uh, the struggle, the, the, the weight of financial burden. Deal? Okay, so if that's you, if you know someone, I want you to utilize this tool, please, please. But let's go back uh, to that passage that I just read a moment ago from Luke. Because now the question is, okay, so, but what does Jesus have to say to those whom much has been given? Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, or what does Jesus have to say to those of us who like a medium amount has been given? I don't necessarily know where I fall in this sort of spectrum. And so they're just like, well, put me in the, put me in the medium. What about that? Because um, Jesus actually has a lot to say, has a lot to say on this particular topic of this intersectionality between faith and finances. But as a sort of uh, foreshadowing, it's actually not at all what you think. Let's dig in. So if you have your Bibles with you and you want to follow along, again, today we're going to be camped out in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, one of the many passages of Scripture that, again, deals with this uh, sort of intersection between our faith and our financial world, comes to us from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. So uh, second letter, meaning he's got some relationship with these folks. He's done life with these folks. He helped start this community. And so here on the second letter, uh, he's writing to them, he's teaching them about all different topics and arenas of Christian faith and life. But by the time he gets to chapter 9, he talks about the importance of generosity, generosity within the Christian life. In fact, Paul goes so far as to say this, that for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove you are obedient to the good news of Christ, at least according to Paul. One of the markers, one of the sort of hallmark characteristics and traits of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus is you were someone who was generous with that which God has given to you. And you know this, if you've read any of the Gospels, this is definitely in keeping with the same thing that Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Blessed are those who give rather than receive. And so it seems like our tradition's in good standing and it's in sort of alignment with what you find in Scripture in that what it means to have a well-balanced faith, a well-rounded faith, is part of what that means is, yes, you are someone who prays. Yes, you are someone who sees the value in communal and public worship. Yes, you, you know the importance of sharing and witnessing to your faith and serving uh, the kingdom. But generosity is amongst those five key practices of what it means to be someone who claims to follow Jesus. Now, as we're digging into this, uh, for some of you, generosity actually comes very, very naturally to you. In fact, as I look out, uh, I know some of you well enough to know that you are incredibly generous people. You're incredibly generous uh, with others, with the world, with uh, the church, and with neighbors in need. And so when you look at those five, you might have other areas uh, where you're struggling, but this isn't one of them. And if that's you, kudos, keep it up. Keep growing, keep pushing into this wonderful gift that God has given to you. But I also know, in conversations with many of us, uh, that this is also an area where many of us struggle. That to be a generous person, for some of us, feels antithetical to who we are. It feels like a struggle. It feels like this place where, gosh, we have a lot of room to grow. And if that's you, if this is a place in your faith where you feel like you stand some area to grow, what I want to say to you that might help you understand this a little bit better is that generosity is actually a symptom. It's a symptom of actually something so much deeper. Your and my ability to be generous is actually largely dependent upon uh, these three things. These three things. If you actually dig at generosity, you'll find that uh, someone's ability to be generous 
is largely dictated by these three questions. So number one, the first indicator as to how generous you might be is number one, what level of responsibility do you feel like you have for other people? Okay, so first question. Largely, uh, one of the determining factors of someone who's generous is do you believe you have any responsibility for the people outside of your sphere? Any responsibility for their well-being, their needs? Number two, when you think about your stuff, the wealth and all the things that you've accumulated, what role do you feel like you have? So do you see yourself as an owner of those things? This is mine. I got mine, and it's mine. I earned this thing, and so I ain't sharing it with nobody. They can go find it for themselves. Do you see yourself as an owner of that which you have found in this life? Or a manager, someone who's been called to steward and manage that which has been entrusted to you? And then thirdly and finally, if you're looking for an indicator, something that will help you sort of figure out what level of generosity you do or don't possess, you got to ask this question. Do you believe your needs will be met? Do you wake up? Do you sort of move about in the world trusting that your needs will be met? Or do you actually have a low trust in anyone, definitely God, in meeting all of your needs? And so it's your job. It is your responsibility to make sure you meet all your needs, you defend all your needs, and you need to anxiously sue to be uh, sort of preoccupying yourself with what could go wrong, so take away those needs. Oftentimes, when I talk to people about generosity, what we're actually talking about is not generosity. It's this stuff. And so I want to encourage you that if that's you, if you find yourself here today, you're like, yeah, I got some room to grow in generosity. Maybe these are actually the places to start. Maybe we can't even talk about being a generous person in the world because right now, you don't trust other people. Your biggest obstacle to giving, to sharing, is you actually don't trust other people. You don't trust institutions, you don't trust groups, or maybe you just, your cynicism about the world and your skepticism about the world has risen to a new height to where you're like, I don't trust that ain't nobody gonna do anything good with what I give to them. So I'm just gonna keep it to myself. Or maybe for you, it's you don't trust yourself. Maybe you've just made some mistakes along the way. You've made some difficult decisions along the way that's hindered your ability to trust. You're like, I can't share because I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm very impulsive. i got to buy that. I'm going to buy it. Click. got to buy it. Or maybe for you, let's just be really real. Let's be really, really real. Maybe the whole reason why generosity is a struggle is because deep, deep down, you don't actually trust those passages of Scripture where it says that God is not only aware of all of your needs, but will care for and tend to all of your needs. And so again, if that's you, I want to encourage you to start here. Start your work here. Because that's the only way we reach what Paul talks about in verse 7. So what does he say in verse 7? He says, this is the goal. The goal when it comes to generosity, the goal when it comes to gift giving, to sharing with other people, the goal is to reach a place where you are cheerful about it. You ain't hesitant about it. You're not doing so under pressure. You're not doing so out of obligation. You're not doing so because some pastor got on some stage and sort of wrangled your arm into going, okay, 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 I'll give. God actually wants you to reach this place where you're like, holy cow, this is, this is fun. This is, brings joy to not only to me but to the world to hold my stuff in this way instead of this Before we go any further, um, part of what we've been doing throughout the course of this sermon series is we've just been sort of like calling out the elephant in the room. So what I mean by that is, so all month long, we've been talking about the importance of recommitting yourself to being more present in church. And we've been talking about recommitting yourself to praying more and recommitting yourself to sharing your faith openly with other people. And we've said all along that Whenever a pastor gets up to talk about the importance of these things, let's just be real, it kind of feels funny, doesn't it? It can feel a little self-serving. And particularly, even, particularly and especially this topic. Some of you have been hurt by church, you've been burned by church. And so the moment those words came out of my mouth, you thought to yourself, mm-hmm, He's just talking about this because he wants us to give more. 
He's just talking about this because he wants us to write, you know, bigger checks or have bigger investment in the church. And so for those who I'm still getting to know, maybe this is your first time here. If so, welcome. Talking about giving. Holy, holy. <laughs> if this is your first time here, uh, one of the commitments that I've made, not just to you, but I've made it to myself, is that I want to be the most brutally honest pastor that I can be. Again, not just for your sake, but for my sake. I want to reach the end of my career, and I want to be the same person up here as I am out there. So this is the only way I know how to do it, just to be brutally and sometimes very uncomfortably honest. And so all to say, if we left here today and you cornered me, and you're like, no, we're going to do this interview style. No, no sort of like fluffing it and whatnot. Give me the answer. Do you, Kyle, want one of the responses to this message to be for me to either invest more in the life of the church or to just start investing in the mission ministry of this place? Yes or no? Give me an answer. The answer is yes. But if you want my full answer, it's actually yes and. It's yes and. Now, Kyle, what does that mean? Like, kind of break that down for me. Why part of my answer is yes is because, good gracious, friends, how in the world could my answer be anything but that when I have seen front row seats to the impact and the influence your gifts and your generosity has made in the life of this place and beyond? These are just the ones I could fit on a screen. In this year alone, what your generosity has made possible in and through the mission ministry of this place is we paid for the tuition of 22 preschoolers in the Dominican Republic for an entire year. We baptized 34 children and adults. We've commissioned 50-plus neighborhood missionaries who are serving all over this area in causes and in organizations that are aligned with their passions. We sent over 30 students on retreats, taught nearly 100 kids during VBS. We've built five homes in Apex alone with Habitat for Humanity. We've placed over 50 people in small groups, and right now, on a weekly basis, we're reaching somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 households via our live stream. If you're asking me, do you want us to give, that's like asking me, do you want the ministries of this place to do anything in the world? And so the answer is unapologetically yes. Absolutely yes. Without your generosity, none of this happens. Without your generosity, I actually don't have any idea what we are. Because we're not an organization that cares about the next generation. We're not an organization that cares about life change. And we're not an organization that cares about the world, pockets of the world that are suffering from extreme poverty. I actually have no idea what we are. So yes... And and the other reason why I'm so big on generosity, why I believe it is the absolutely best pathway, is because, friends, it's also what's best for you as an individual. It is what's best for you. It is the best pathway I know for your life. Every week when we get up here, we talk about a whole host of different spiritual principles. We talk about the importance of forgiveness. We talk about the importance of justice. We talk about the importance of uh, grace and compassion and mercy. And friends, all of those things are really, really good for the world. But you want to know who else they're really good for? You. Those practices, the reason why we preach them so much is because they are the remedy that you're seeking. They are the medicine for your soul that you need. And friends, the same is exactly true for generosity. Whether you are aware of it or not, if you participate and you you sort of use it as an exercise to participate in the exercise, the discipline of generosity, it protects you from stuff. For one, it protects you from a meaningless life. If you want to reach the end of your life and have it just be completely meaningless... Keep all of your stuff to yourself. If you want your life to have no impact, if you want it to influence nobody, keep it all to yourself. Because it will not only stay with you, 
but it'll die with you. To each their own. I can't think of a more sad legacy I could leave on this planet than that. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, used to say this. He used to say, if I die and there's even a cent to my name that I have not uh, sort of pre-planned for this to go somewhere to do good for somebody, I've failed. I've failed to manage and steward the great gifts that God has given to me. So it'll protect you from a meaningless life. It'll also protect you from a fearful life. Anybody else found this to be true? Anybody else found this to be true? This is not the case with everybody I know, but there's some people I've watched And the more stuff they accumulate, the more wealth they accumulate, the more scared they become. The more they feel like other people are trying to take it from them. Anybody watch the show Succession? This is why Kendall looks like this every single episode. He's terrified that he's succeeding his dad and inheriting this billions and billion, billion dollar company. He's terrified that someone's going to take it away. And so it runs his life. Start to finish. Generosity comes along and liberates you from that. Generosity protects you from being possessed by your wealth. And yes, I chose that word in particular on purpose. So this discipline, it it protects you from a meaningless existence, from a fearful existence. And to come back to our scripture passage once more, it protects you from having an unhappy life. I think think Paul got it right. I think he got it right. I think the way of generosity is so much more joyful It is so much more happy. It's so much more fun than a stingy life. And you want to know who single-handedly has been the greatest teacher for me on this, has been the greatest example of this for me? It's my six-year-old son. My six-year-old son is the most generous person in our household. Whenever he gets anything good, candy, dessert, brand new video game, It's amazing. He always wants to share. Why? Because my son understands, and I think this is true of many kids. We forget this as adults. He understands that it's way better to have a little bit less himself so that everyone around him can feel what he's feeling can experience what he's experiencing. It goes back to that ancient quote that is so true. Every day of my life, it's more and more and more true. That says, a burden shared is cut in half. And a blessing shared is doubled. What do you do with the other good things in your life? You tell people about it. You share it with other people. And you walk away from that experiencing, realizing that it was way more joyful for all of us to feel this together than for me to feel it all by myself. And I'll close here. Banji, you can go ahead and come on up. You see, so often... Messages like these, whenever they're spoken of or addressed by pastors or churches, what's so interesting is so often uh, they leave you feeling those things we talked about earlier. So often you leave uh, messages on giving and gift giving and generosity. You leave these sermons feeling guilty. You feel worse. You feel like a bad person. And let's just like sort of say it really, really simply. Sometimes you leave these feeling like, gosh, Jesus is no fun. Jesus wants to take all of my fun. That's all Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to take all my cool stuff. He's trying to rob me of all these cool experiences. He's trying to prevent me from having a fun life. I don't know if I want to do this. Like, this stinks. Like, I don't actually want to sign up for a miserable life. And friends, that's good news if you've ever felt that way, because that ain't who Jesus is. 
How do I know that? Because he told us. What did he say in the Gospels? For I have come to give you what kind of life? Miserable life? Is that what I heard? Um, Unhappy life? Awful life? Don't get to do anything cool sort of life? What does he say? What does he say? I have come to give you what? An abundant life. I have come to show you a life you would have never known. I've come to show you an existence that's so richer. It's so much deeper than anything you could have ever found by yourself. I've come to give you an abundant life. Now, the only caveat is that the you in his statement was a plural you. So what not I've come to give you by yourself an abundant life? I've come to give you all an abundant life. And that don't happen until those who have way more than enough share with those who do not have enough so that slowly, incrementally, we can move closer and closer towards this vision that we see both in the New Testament and in the Old. In the Old Testament, they use this word to describe this world where everybody's needs are taken care of and everybody's thriving. They call it shalom, which for us is peace. The world will see no peace until that happens. I always find it interesting that so often when preachers talk about heaven and the afterlife, it's all the, the sort of governing analogy, the governing scene that they portray is like a courtroom. Someone's guilty, someone's not, and who's free and who's not, whatever. Who's going to get judged? But what's interesting is if you actually go and read the Gospels, you'll find that the predominant metaphor that Jesus uses to describe heaven is a party. He talks about it like this heavenly banquet feast. So let's just get really simple. Let's just make it really, really simple as we leave here today. The question for you is do you want to reach that party as someone who, sure, might have a little bit lighter pockets, but you're surrounded by the most people and you're having the most fun? Or would you rather be the person who shows up to the party, stands off to the corner by themselves with the only thing to keep them company is their stuff? It's up to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. All God's children said, amen. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.